My name is Peter Robinson. I'm a professor of English at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon on the plains of Western Canada. In the corner of a classroom in which I teach, there is a portrait of a man in uniform. For years, I've looked at this portrait and wondered about this man. The uniform is of a British soldier at the time of the First World War. The man is slightly built. He is looking directly into the room with a serious expression on his face. Who was this man? Why is he wearing this uniform? What happened to him? His story, I discovered, is not just his story. It is a story of a young province, Saskatchewan, in a country finding itself Canada. It is the story of young Canadians discovering their country in the battlefields of the Great War. The man in the portrait is Reginald John Godfrey Bateman. He was born in 1883 in Listowel, in the west of Ireland. His family were part of the Anglo-Irish ascendancy. Reginald was born into the class of aristocrats, officials, landowners and capitalists which ruled Ireland. They were Church of England, English-speaking and educated, owning almost all the land and grand houses and fiercely faithful to Great Britain, to Empire and to Queen. Reginald's father, Godfrey Bateman, was an official in this ruling class. He was a national inspector of schools with authority over men much older than himself. His eldest son was Reginald John Godfrey, born 1883 and the subject of our story. Godfrey was able to give his son, Reginald, the elite education fit for the rulers of the empire. Reginald went first to Portora Royal School, the Eton of Ireland. You studied hard. You played hard, especially at rugby. And then you went on to rule England and its empire in Ireland, India, Australia and Canada. Oscar Wilde and Samuel Beckett also went to Portora Royal. After Portora, Reginald went to Trinity College Dublin, the university of the ruling class. Reginald was an academic star. He won prizes and honours in every year and finished at Trinity in 1905. He took a post as an English teacher at Cork Grammar School, a newly founded school for the Protestant elite. This was not Portora Royal, it was not a university post, but it was very respectable. Our story now moves to Canada, to the new province of Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan was founded in 1905, the same year Reginald finished at Trinity. A new province needs a new university. In 1907, the Saskatchewan Legislature passed a University Act. Walter Murray became president of the new University of Saskatchewan. This university was to start teaching its first classes in September 1909. In just over a year, Murray had to choose the site for the university, locate and equip premises to house students, and find professors to teach them. There was no time to advertise, shortlist, interview and appoint. Instead, Murray asked a few of the right people for recommendations. He needed an English professor. So he asked the professor of English at Trinity College Dublin, Edward Dowden. Dowden thought of his past star student, Reginald Bateman, teaching at Cork Grammar School. I know no one whom I could more confidently recommend for appointment to the vacant professorship of English literature at Saskatchewan University than Reginald Bateman. This was a risky appointment. Reginald had never held a university post. He was actually teaching in a school, not a university. He had never started a doctorate or undertaken formal research. He was just 26 years old. But for Murray, his youth and good character weighed the most. On the 23rd of June, 1909, Reginald accepted a one-year trial appointment as Professor of English and French 
at the new university. Up to now, Reginald has appeared something of a cipher. He was the perfect schoolboy, university student and school teacher, and the nervous young applicant for a job far away. But in one of his letters to Murray that summer, we get a glimpse of the personality behind the good grades. I got hold of a pamphlet about Saskatoon, which makes it out to be an earthly paradise on a small scale. So I'm quite looking forward to sharing in its delights. My people used to sympathize with me for having to go to the Wild West, but this unfortunate pamphlet has put a stop to all that. There is a hint of irreverence about the gentle dig at Saskatoon's pretensions and an attractive self-deprecation about the reference to his family. In those first years, the university was so small, still less than 400 students, that it was more like a club than a university. There were skating parties on the river, receptions in the Murray's home, variety nights, sing songs around the piano in the larger classroom, rotten tomatoes and bags of water flung from the roof of the Drinkle building. Reginald flourished in this atmosphere of bonhomie, sport and serious learning, rather similar to the university life he knew in Dublin. The professor of English taught boxing. He gave public lectures in English. He sponsored the Literary Society. He was founder of the Glee Club, trainer of the arts and science football team, association football, as in soccer. He played in and was captain of the Varsity Senior Football Team. Reginald did not just work hard. He had a vision. The teacher who knows a piece of poetry with his head only can never teach it as it ought to be taught. He may be able to repeat it word for word. He may know all about its history, its philology, its structure. But if he has not felt it, if he has not reproduced it sympathetically within himself, he cannot teach it. For Reginald, reading the best books, the great literature, made you a better person. Literature is not only the source of our highest pleasure, but it is the source of our highest development. By this logic, one might reckon that John Diefenbaker, who got just 40% in his literature exam, should never have become Prime Minister of Canada. According to Reginald, only the elite are capable of this highest development. It is a few who lead. Plato, Shakespeare, Newton, Kant, Darwin. It is through these few, and only through these few, that humanity moves onward and upward. As we will see, these words are key to understanding why Reginald enlisted to fight in the trenches. By the summer of 1914, Walter Murray's gamble on the young school teacher from Ireland had paid off. The university was prospering. Reginald was a valued and popular professor at a flourishing new university. He had bought a piece of land on 11th Street. There are hints that he had found a woman. Marriage and children might follow. What could go wrong? as the glorious Saskatchewan summer of 1914 drew to a close. We all know what went wrong. On Sunday, the 28th of June, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo by a Yugoslav nationalist. 37 days later, after a sequence of stupidities, blunders and grandiose miscalculations, Germany invaded Belgium and France, and England declared war on Germany. Germany's ally, Austria-Hungary, also went to war with Russia, so bringing every great European power into the conflict. The Great War was on. Britain was at war. Therefore, Canada was at war. In the first months of the war, young Canadian men rushed to enlist in the first Canadian contingent. The example of these young men, the drumbeat of editorial urgings, 
The enlistment posters and recruiters everywhere set a challenge to every young man. Should I enlist or not? Reginald could very well have chosen not to enlist, or at least not to enlist immediately. He was a professor at the university with hundreds of students waiting for him to teach them. Yet, just two months after the declaration of war, on the 26th of October, 1914, he enlisted in Saskatoon for the Canadian Expeditionary Overseas Forces. What moved him to this choice? On the day before he joined, Reginald gave a talk to the university YMCA in which he set out his attitude to the war. War is the one supreme, the only entirely adequate test of a nation's spiritual quality. Readiness for war is a token of national righteousness. It was war which gave birth to the ideals of chivalry and honor. It is war which keeps those ideals alive in an age of sordid commercialism. It is the possibility of war, however remotely realized, which makes our young men keep their bodies clean and strong. For Reginald, war was a moral matter. High-souled, clear-sighted men, because they believe in the justice of their cause and consider it not only a duty, but a privilege to lay down their lives, if necessary, to maintain it. As a teacher, Reginald thought he was advancing humanity towards a golden future by passing on the sacred values found in literature to a few. He saw war as a supreme test of these values. To go to war is to affirm those values. So, on the 26th of October, Reginald formally joined the army. He was not alone. Another professor, Arthur Brehold, signed up at Saskatoon on the same day. Three of his students, including Arthur Grushi, also enlisted in Saskatoon, among a contingent of 17 students at the university, 19 altogether, including the two professors. Bateman was now a soldier. However, the army he wanted to join barely existed. The first parade of Reginald's new regiment, the 28th Battalion, took place in the old horse show building in Winnipeg on the 1st of November. It was a strange sight, with soldiers in many different uniforms mingling with civilians in whatever clothes they had on. A postcard from Reginald to Murray on the 4th of November makes it all seem a jolly romp. From Privates Brayhout and Bateman to His Beloved Excellency the President, greetings. We are both well and getting very fit. The grub is good and we are enjoying it all. However, in a sign of the blunders to come, the old horse show building was unsuitable for billeting so many men. It offered no shelter from a harsh winter and hundreds of the 2,000 volunteers fell ill over the winter. Finally, after months of training, Reginald's regiment, the 28th Battalion, left Winnipeg. On the 11th of June, 1915, they arrived at Dibgate Camp, Kent. They were getting closer to the front line. From the 1st of July, we can follow Reginald's movements in the official war diary of the 28th Battalion. The war diary gives a sense of how the soldiers pass their time. A celebration of Dominion Day, musketry practice, lectures, parades, practice in entrenching, bayoneting and bombing. In this war diary, we can read the entry for the 7th of July, 1914. It was a day of rough weather, with winds interfering with shooting practice. And here is the bald record. Private A.G. Gurushi, machine gun section, was drowned while bathing. If Reginald had a favourite student, a single person who he thought might receive and pass on the sacred flame of knowledge, it would have been Arthur Grushi. He was able, ambitious, intelligent, 
One of those students who is in every activity, top of every class, the spirit in every room. One can only guess at the life Arthur might have had. Instead, he died on a windy day on the south coast of England. The first man from the university to die. Reginald wrote to Murray, describing Grouchy's death. He seems to have lost some of his enthusiasm for war. There are many things about this life that I like and many things that are irksome. On the whole, I'm looking forward to the conclusion of the whole matter and just making the best of things until then. For weeks, the regiment trained and trained. Finally, on the 17th of September, the battalion sailed for France. Day by day, they moved closer to the front line. On the 25th of September, they were ordered to take over part of the trenches at Camel, six miles southwest of Ypres, in the west of Belgium. According to accounts of this day, the deployment was a mess. Two companies of the battalions blundered into each other and started firing upon one another, fortunately without injuries. At last, Reginald had reached the front line. The battalion war diary tells us how the 28th fared over Reginald's first months in the trenches. The Germans launched a fierce attack on the trenches held by the 28th on the 8th of October. The Canadians yielded not an inch of ground. For months, the 28th settled into the rhythm of trench warfare, patrolling no man's land at night, maintaining the trenches, watching out for snipers, learning exactly how to defend the trenches and to control the land in front of them. Waiting, waiting for the next large enemy attack or the next Allied advance. This might come in days, weeks, months. Until then, all quiet on the Western Front. Months stretched into a hard winter. Many of the battalion contracted flu so severe they had to be sent home. But not Reginald. In his four years in the army, he suffered barely a sniffle. Reginald did well in these months, and on the 19th of March, the war diary records that he was commissioned as lieutenant. On March the 31st, 1916, the 28th was moved a few miles from Camel, but Reginald had left the regiment. While Reginald was in France, Murray manoeuvred for the creation of a Canadian army unit made up of soldiers from the universities of Western Canada. Murray wanted Reginald to lead the Saskatchewan Company. In March 1916, after six months in the trenches, Reginald was called back to Saskatchewan to establish, recruit and lead this new company. On the 22nd of April, he gave a talk in Saskatoon about his experiences in the trenches. This is a very different talk from the one he gave to the YMCA on the eve of enrolling, 18 months before. There is no more talk of the glory of war, of how it ennobles an individual and a nation. Instead, he says, Everybody at home expects a tale of glory and heroism, but the days of pomp and circumstance of battle are over, and it is only the ideals for which we are fighting that can dignify the mean and ugly reality of present-day war. He goes on to describe life in the trenches. The shortest phrase which I know of, which attempts to sum up life in the trenches, is this. Days of unendurable monotony and moments of indescribable fear. In the peace and safety of Saskatoon, his deepest thoughts are with the soldiers he left behind holding the line by the Eep salient. But best of all to look back upon are the good comrades we found in the trenches, whom we knew we could trust to the death if need be. However much we appreciate the comfort of home and the kindness of our friends here, the thoughts of every returned soldier are now and will ever be while this war lasts with the boys they left behind them. There was a reason for them to be on his mind. 
his old battalion was involved in one of the most notable military calamities of the war, the Battle of the St. Eloy Craters. The British detonated seven huge mines beneath the German trenches at St. Eloy, a few miles from the trenches the 28th had held. The British commanders wanted to take over these craters and advance right into the German front line. And so, over the next weeks, wave after wave of troops, first British, then Canadians, was sent to the craters. The craters lay completely exposed to German gunfire from higher ground nearby. By the time the first Canadians attacked on the 4th of April, after the British had been driven back, the craters were filled with water and the German artillery had destroyed almost all the trenches, so troops had to hide in shell holes. Here is what Private Fraser of the Canadian 27th Battalion saw when he looked out over the craters at dawn on the 4th of April. When day broke, the sights that met our gaze were so horrible and ghastly that they beggar description. Heads, arms, and legs were protruding from the mud at every yard, and dear knows how many bodies the earth swallowed. Thirty corpses were at least showing in the crater, and beneath its clayey waters other victims must be lying killed and drowned. The 28th Battalion's turn came on the 6th of April. Three officers and 16 men were killed, and some 72 wounded, in little more than a day. By the 10th of April, conditions were so bad that one company commander wrote in a report that for the Canadians to stay would be committing useless murder. But the British generals insisted. The assault had to go on. Canadians had to continue to die. And so it carried on for days, until the attack was finally abandoned. Over the next few months, Reginald worked to establish his new command and the new university's battalion. Now, he had no enthusiasm for the war. I can't say that the prospect of returning to the front lines gives me any pleasure. All sense of romance has gone out of the business for me, and it is now a matter of grim necessity. More bad news from France. On a single day, the 2nd of June, 1916, three more of Reginald's students, Robert Grant, Lawrence Homer and Percy Kisby were killed in the German attack on the Canadian lines at Sanctuary Wood near Ypres, a few miles from where Reginald had been with the 28th. Another student, Bobby Turiff, was reported as wounded, missing and presumed dead in the Battle of the Somme on the 15th of September 1916. And a fifth student, Wilfred Wilson, was wounded in the Battle of the Somme and died on the 11th of October. On the 26th of October, Reginald's new regiment, the Western University's battalion, left Winnipeg on its way to France. It arrived in England in November. The next months were intensely frustrating to Reginald. Whatever promises had been made to Murray and others, that the 196 would be kept together to fight as a unit in France, those promises were not kept. The disasters of 1916, with 60,000 Allied troops lost on the first day of the Battle of the Somme alone, had left regiments across France badly under strength. The 196 was cannibalized to the point where it effectively ceased to exist this left Reginald as the major of a company that no longer existed. Bad news kept coming. Three more of Reginald's students died in the opening months of 1917. Michael McMillan was killed in action on Vimy Ridge on the 9th of April. Reginald Lavers, who won the military medal, was also killed at Vimy. Arthur Lloyd, who had enlisted with Reginald in October 1914, died on the 8th of May. It galled Reginald that he sat in a safe office in London while many of his students and former comrades fought in the Great Battle of Vimy Ridge in April 1917. 
His disenchantment can be sensed in the last long letter we have from Reginald, written to his youngest brother John on the 29th of April, 1917, in which he speaks of his determination to get back to the front, to be with the men he had trained. This letter gives the nearest we have to a personal statement by Reginald of what he believed in. To get and give as much happiness as possible seems to be our plain duty. And if abnormalities on a tremendous scale like this war crop up, it is the duty of everyone to get to work and sacrifice, if necessary, his own chance of happiness in order to restore a state of things where happiness is possible for others. By now, he had seen a lot of death. There is a fatalism in the last paragraphs of this letter. I might have been killed, but I was prepared for that. And I think there is no better way a man can die. It is comparatively seldom in the world's history that a man gets the chance to die splendidly. Most deaths are somewhat inglorious endings to not very glorious careers. A war like the present gives a man a chance to cancel at one stroke all the pettiness of his life. Reginald could have stayed exactly where he was, in a comfortable post in England, doing very little. But he did not want that. He used every effort to return to the front, and finally managed it. He had to drop two whole ranks, from major all the way to lieutenant. If he did this, he could join the Canadian 46th Battalion, the famous Suicide Battalion. On the 13th of June 1917, he wrote to Murray once more, reporting that he was about to return to the front line. Accordingly, he would no longer be part of the supposed 196th Western University's Battalion, into which Murray had put so much effort. Indeed, although the 196th had effectively ceased to exist, apparently Murray was still recruiting for it. Reginald's words to Murray are startling. I confess I can't see the point of keeping up the pretense that that battalion is still in existence unless you are doing it for political reasons. And I certainly don't think that men should be told they're being sent to a battalion which only exists in your own imaginations. Very rarely can a university president, and particularly Murray, have been so sharply and decisively rebuked. By the end of June, Reginald was back on the front line with the 46th. June and July were peaceful months. They had been in the heart of the great Vimy Ridge battle and merited a rest. In August 1917, they were ordered into battle again near Lenz. In August, the battalion launched a major attack on Lenz. The attack was successful, but Reginald was wounded. It was November before he was back with the 46th, just after the battalion had been involved in the disaster of Passchendaele, where 500 yards of the vilest terrain in Europe cost over 1,500 Canadian casualties. Four months again, days of monotony and moments of terror. By spring 1918, a huge German offensive was expected. On the 21st of March, the Germans launched a massive attack on the British armies to the south of Lieven, where the 46th then was. For weeks, they stayed constantly in the lines, seven days at the front, seven in support, seven in reserve. Once more, the 46th was given a break over the summer. In this period, Reginald wrote the last letter we have from him, to Murray again, dated the 9th of July. Nearly four years of army life have not improved my knowledge of literature. Still more of his students had died in the years since he joined the 46th. Clifford McConnell died on the 18th of August, 1917. George Swift, nine days later. George Patterson was killed in action on the 2nd of April, 1918 and recommended for a Victoria Cross. Willis Hunt was killed in action 
on the 11th of July, and John Dawson was killed on the first day of the Allied attack on the 8th of August. Once more, at the end of the summer, the suicide battalion was ordered back into the front. On the 7th of August, 1918, they arrived at Amiens. On the next day, the Allies launched the last great offensive of the war, all along the Somme and including Amiens. We are in the last months of the war and the last weeks of Reginald's life. By the 12th of August, the Canadians had won a massive victory, with Germans surrendering in thousands. The end of the war was finally close, but it was not over yet. Another of Reginald's students, John McPherson, was killed at Monchy on the 26th of August. On the 2nd of September, the suicide battalion attacked part of the mighty Hindenburg Line, the primary German defence position in the area, at the village of Dury. Reginald had been promoted to acting captain and led his company into this action. The attack was successful, and the next day, the 3rd of September, a headquarters was established in the village, in a quarry lined with dugouts. A letter from Reginald's father to Murray tells what happened. Reg and other officers were killed by a big bursting shell which came down almost vertically on my dear son, killing him on the spot. The remains of my son, owing to the heavy shell fire and the necessity of all available men as stretcher bearers, could not be brought back to the cemetery. But on the evening of the 4th of September, the chaplain, Captain Buck, gathered a party who, amid the roar of guns and the scream of shells, paid their last respects to a very gallant comrade and one of the best loved men in the battalion. So died Reginald John Godfrey Bateman, teacher, soldier, friend, son and brother. He was 34 years old. Reginald's students continued to die. On a single day, the 28th of September, 1918, William Hunter and Harold Blair died. Another, Harry Cantillon, died of his wounds in 1919. Altogether, 21 of Reginald's students died, among the 69 from the university who died. Nor was the suffering done in the Bateman family. Reginald's younger brother, Arthur Cyril, a talented sportsman who played both rugby and cricket for Ireland, was a doctor with a Royal Medical Corps. He had won the Military Cross and held the rank of captain. On the 28th of March, 1918, he was wounded and taken prisoner by the Germans near Arras. Finally, in February of the following year, the war three months over, his father gave up hope of his return. At the end of his anguished letter to Murray of October, 1918, describing Reginald's death, Godfrey exclaims, my eyes fill as I write. My beloved one in a foreign land, red with his blood which he shed for it, for me, for honour, for truth, for all that makes life worth living. Was his life wasted? No. A thousand times, no. It is hard to share Godfrey's hope. Here is the historian Leon Wolfe's view. It remains to be said, as usual, that the war ended on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. It had meant nothing, solved nothing, and proved nothing. And in so doing had killed 8,538,315 men and variously wounded 21,219,452. Ezra Pound put it more brutally. 
There died a myriad, and of the best among them, for an old bitch gone in the teeth, for a botched civilization. In another of Godfrey's letters, written to Murray on the 4th of August 1915, he described how Reginald and Arthur came to visit for a few days' leave early in the war. There was a knock on the door of his house overlooking Dublin Bay in the early hours of the morning. His wife opened the door, expecting the baker. It was Reggie. His father described the visit. He enjoyed himself thoroughly, but had to leave too soon. His mother, sister and youngest brother, who's devoted to him, saw him off. As the mail boat went from her berth, getting up steam and very soon into her full stride, we, i.e. John Victor and I, ran along the pier to get a view as long as we could of him. This is the last record we have of Reggie and his family together. His father and youngest brother, John Victor, running along the Dublin Bay Pier in the early morning, straining for a last glimpse of the loved son and brother. After the war, Reginald's youngest brother, John Victor, graduated from Trinity College, Dublin. His father, Godfrey, wrote to Murray, and John Victor came to the university in 1920. His youngest daughter, Jean, the niece Reginald never knew, still lives in Saskatoon, and her daughter, Reginald's great-niece, works at the university. We remember them. Saskatoon remembered Reginald in a memorial service on the 13th of October, 1918. All Saskatoon stopped for this service. We remember Reginald in the memorial volume published in 1922, in the Bateman Scholarship and in the university chair, which I hold. We remember them in the memorial gates, in the plaques in the McKinnon Building, the oldest university building. We remember them in the Bateman Cup, inaugurated by Godfrey Bateman to memorialise his two lost sons and still played for every year by the Irish Rugby Union. We remember them in the monuments in France and Belgium. Especially, we remember them in the great monument at Vimy Ridge. On the outside wall of the monument, are carved the names of 11,285 Canadians killed in France and with no grave. Among those 11,000 names are those of the 69 students and staff of the university who died in the war. And among those names is that of Reginald John Godfrey Bateman. It's a long, long way to Tipperary.